Can you hear me? Hello, hello. That's okay. I think that I have a loud enough voice that you hear me, right? Um, we might want to make sure that it's fixed by the time we have the, uh, the next speaker. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you, the organizer. Uh, that's a great uh, start this morning. For, uh, um, so, and I'm here because I will, uh, I've, been, uh, um, I've given the pleasure and, uh, to invite the, uh, introduce the uh, uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Craig Iancio, this morning. Personally, I started to hear about Craig when I was uh, still a, a postdoc back in Wisconsin uh, and uh, at UW Madison. And at that time, uh, I didn't know him, but people were telling me uh, whenever people were talking about oh, Craig, they had a good smile and they were telling a good thing about him. So I, uh, I could just uh, uh, understand that he, he, would, he was a very great, uh, he had a very great personality and he was an outstand, outstanding scientist. Then after a short time I was uh, here at Penn State, I could start to understand and working in the same department, I started to understand what they were talking about. So besides being a, a well-recognized expert in plant breeding and genetics internationally, he's a hard worker, very pragmatic and a visionary uh, scientist. Uh, being in the same department as a young scientist, he, uh, I started to interact with him and one of the first uh, uh, advice he gave me was uh, make sure that you know how to measure your impact. And God, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging to make a mistake, you got to do something good because Otherwise, uh, uh, he, he, he already gave me the good direction. Um, and uh, the reason is because in everything he does, he looks forward to, uh, to, to uh, have an impact on everything he does. So he uh, currently lead the sweet potato breeding program at NC State, one of the uh, most uh, productive breeding program uh, worldwide for sweet potato. Um, this program is, uh, has uh, significantly contributed to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the growth of the sweet potato industry here in North Carolina. Uh, he has developed over 40 varieties uh, that uh, are currently grown uh, in the US and uh, other places. Um, and, uh, but his impact doesn't stay here at uh, North Carolina, at NC State. He has a large impact on his research also uh, internationally. He has been, um, he's the lead PI on the uh, genomic tool for sweet potato, uh, the sweet potato project, a multidisciplinary project that was focused on developing the model genomic genome, genetic and bioinformatic tool for sweet potato crop improvement in sub Saharan Africa. This is one of the high value projects that the Bill Gates Foundation has been uh, funding in the last uh, five, uh, five years. He coordinated an international group that worked in this project that involved several collaborators uh, from different parts of the world, including uh, uh, Africa, Uganda, Ghana, uh, Australia, and here in the US, uh, Michigan State and uh, Cornell University. Uh, for his outstanding uh, research activity in 2015, he was appointed as a William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor, highest honor open to faculty member at College of Agricultural and Life Science. Prior to being at NC State, uh, Craig was a senior fellow at, in, at the SIP, a CIA in Colombia, uh, in the Rice Tropical uh, Breeding Program. Before that, he was postdoc uh, research associate at uh, Cornell University and US Peace Crop Volunteer based in New uh, West uh, Indies. So with this, I would uh, uh, please join me to welcome our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Craig Yanjo. You can start. Everybody. You can start to chat. Yeah, no problem. Uh, well, I wouldn't believe everything he says, uh, but it's really a pleasure to be here. And what I would like to do is is to uh, to say, well done, all of 
the students. And, and I'm really totally impressed with this program. I've, I've been vaguely aware of it over the past couple of years, uh, but I'm, I'm really exceptionally pleased to be here and to learn about what you're doing. And what I'd like to do real quick, if I could just hang these things up real fast. Let's give them a big hand. I think you guys are inspiring. Honest to gosh. I mean, I really think that the, 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 the youth of the future are, are, are really, they, you inspire me. Uh, and you're, you're doing such nice work. And what I really love to see is, is the connection between our faculty, our graduate students who are learning to mentor, uh, you know, promising young scientists, and, and our high school and our, our college students that are stepping up to the plate uh, to do big things. So I'm, I'm really impressed and fairly well humbled, too. Um, all right, well, let me kind of share some thoughts with you today. And I, I, I actually, I want to thank you for challenging me to sort of think about things a little bit differently, particularly our, our youth again. And the title of my talk, as you can see up there, is that I'm, I'm a breeder. I lead two applied breeding programs in potato and sweet potato. Uh, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of people over the last 20 plus years here at NC State. And I wanted to share some thoughts with you along those lines. Um, I like to give people a, a handle, if you will, a take home thing. My, my takeaways today for you are, are going to be the, the following that are up on the screen. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my programs. I want to, I want to share with you uh, NC State's breeding programs, what, what we're doing at NC State collectively. Uh, I spent a little bit of time talking about what I call crop production global grand challenges. And, and this is where I want, want to sort of challenge the young scientists in the room to begin to think about these things, because truly, the older guys like me aren't really going to solve those problems. Okay, I've got 10, 15 years in the uh, at least. Um, but it's going to be the next generation that's really going to have to tackle these things. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my specific projects and then share with you where I see things going in the future in plant breeding. And my goal here is to try and is to connect things as best I can. Um, I lead a fairly large project. Uh, this is the portfolio of projects that I lead. In. The, the thing that I want you to notice about that portfolio is actually it's, it's, a, it's, it's private industry, uh, public uh, breeding programs, international NGOs, and commodity associations all come together to help us do the job that we do. All right. So the theme there is partnership, cooperation, collaboration, teamwork. Uh, my team Numbers right now, a core group of about 16 or 17 uh, key scientists. We typically employ in my group anywhere between four to eight undergraduates at any one point in time of the year. Uh, and we've really benefited from our undergrads. I'm very fortunate here working at NC State to have access to the, our research station complex. I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Uh, and it's countless people that actually help us get the job done on, on that basis here. Uh, so a lot of people at the research stations, I do a lot of work at the Horticultural Crops Research Station, the Central Crops, Cunningham Research Station, uh, the Sandhills Research Station, the Tidewater Station. My wife, maybe some of you know, is Dr. Gina Fernandez. She does a huge amount of work here at the Piedmont Station too in Salisbury. Uh, so we know that well. Uh, here's my team. Uh, they're, they're really the people that get the job done. I'm really the guy that comes out here and kind of tells the story or, or does my best to tell the story. One of the things that, that I'd like you to notice, it's a pretty diverse team. I really enjoy working in that format. It's, it's with people from all, 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 over, the, all over the globe, literally, uh, really doing some great stuff. Okay, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our plant breeding programs here at NC State. And I really like to blow our horn, if you will. Uh, whenever we get an opportunity, I like to tell folks about plant breeding. Uh, I hope to maybe hook one or two of you uh, today to think about plant breeding as a future career. Uh, one, you need to know that NCSU has world-class plant breeding programs across the spectrum. Uh, our focus and our sweet spot is, is we generate cultivars in germplasm that farmers use. All right, so we make an impact. When Massimo was talking about impact, that's one way that a breeder measures their impact. 
farmers grow the varieties that we developed? And I can say that at NC State, the answer is yes. Uh, sweet potatoes, I'll raise my hand for sweet potatoes. Our variety, Covington, is, is a, is a well-known variety. Uh, it accounts for roughly $340 million in revenue a year at home here in North Carolina. It's grown across the U.S. Uh, we have licenses that are active now in Australia, and we share the materials in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Our peanut varieties here at NC State account for about 74% of the acres of peanuts grown in, in Virginia and North Carolina alone. Uh, I know that we're at the, the Human Health Institute, but this other crop we grow tobacco and tomato. So tobacco, huge crop in North Carolina. Um, it's North Carolina varieties that, that actually uh, account for a large portion of that. Our tomato breeding program out in Mills River in the mountains accounts for a large market share of what we do here also. Uh, we have ornamental breeding programs. There are dozens of varieties you'll find in the landscape across the U.S. and around the globe and all over North Carolina. Uh, one of the things I love about being a plant breeder is that plant breeding is a very collaborative discipline. Uh, if you look across the, 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 the slide there, you'll see that we collaborate with about 60 different faculty across almost every single department in our college, but we also collaborate quite a bit across the university. I really like that. Uh, because we're trying to feed the world, beautify the world, we're on the edge of cutting-edge science. We truly are a transdisciplinary science, and we're moving more and more in that direction every day. And those are things that, are, that I find fascinating about plant breeding. Our students have been, always will be, key to our success. Undergrad, graduate students, postdoctoral scientists really are the people that drive uh, our success and to drive the science forward. So again, I want to thank you for what you're doing, your interest, because really you're going to drive us forward into the future. Um, maybe some of you have heard about this big initiative we call the Plant Sciences Initiative. We also have the Developing Food uh, food Science or the, the Food Processing Initiative, I think it is. What's it called again? I, I want to have the right name. The Bioprocessing Initiatives? There you go. We're engaged with that too. In, in fact, one of my leading collaborators comes out of food science. Uh, and and we, we, we spend a huge amount of time in the fire plant at NC State. There's going to be one similar here. I'm really excited about that. Um, so with that, I'll stop right there. Uh, and you know, that's our, that's our programs in plant breeding. But really, there's a home for every discipline in, in plant breeding, and you can get connected to that. I'll touch base on that a little bit later. Uh, so today my challenge is, is I want to take kind of a, you know, I want to step back a little bit, give you kind of the big picture, if I will. That's one of my challenges. This is actually 500 miles out, courtesy of Google. I want to bring it home a little bit closer to you. I want to talk about some things ongoing in, in the U.S., connected to you there. We're at about 200 miles up now. I'm going to come down, do what we all know this state right here, I hope. North Carolina, you can see a little smiley face. And my goal is to bring it down to the Kanapolis complex here. And, and if I can do that today, I'll, I'll have met at least one of my goals. Uh, okay, so we live in a big world. Uh, I have found uh, this is actually a fairly small world, but it's a very complicated world too. And we have a lot of really big, complex issues that we're wrestling with. Uh, and they frighten me a bit, but I'm also quite excited. Uh, by a small world, I was thinking today, you know, I can jump on a plane, and I've done this a lot of times over the, in the past year. I can be in China within less than 25 hours of total travel time. I can be in East Africa in less than 20 hours of travel time. So really, our world may seem big, but it has gotten phenomenally small. Uh, and it's interconnected in ways that I think that many people don't really think about, but I encourage you in this room to, to think about that a little bit. Uh, as I started to think about the grand challenges that we face, I started to do a little bit of reading, and I drew a lot of content from these three fairly recent publications. And if you want to if you want to know a little bit more about sustainability, uh, how are we going to meet the global challenges in the future, how are we going to feed the world, sustain the world, I would suggest that maybe you take a look at, at these three. One,
conference, an NSF study, or a National Academy of Sciences report, uh, Science Breakthroughs uh, through 2030, just came out a few weeks ago. There are several, several faculty uh, at NC State that are, that are members of, of, this, uh, of this report. Our chancellor led the, the development of the one in the middle, the challenge of, of change put out by the American Public Land Grant Universities Association. That came out last year. And then we have this uh, sustainability challenge coming out of the uh, National Research Council back in 2014. They really covered some great ground. Uh, and uh, what I've done is I've looked at that and I've kind of tried to distill some of the big issues that, that I see as a plant breeder, as a person who's engaged in, in global agricultural development at a fairly high level these days, is you know how do we feed ourselves and sustain our plant in the future? And I, I try to simplify things as best I can, and sometimes there's a risk in that. But as I see it, we, we have these big, big issues right now. We, we need to produce more uh, food on more marginal land. Uh, we have increased pests and diseases, stressed nutrients and water resources, all these problems in, in one quarter. Uh, we have global warming and climate change, which is occurring at an increasing rate. Uh, and it's causing some real some issues. Uh, we have increasing urbanization. I think it was just in the last couple of years that we've actually tipped the balance. There are more people living in urban situations than live in rural situations. Less than one to two percent of the population here in the United States and in the developing world is producing our food. Those are huge differences. Uh, so we have this increasing urbanization. We have increasing poverty and hunger. Uh, and political uh, driven strife. And on the backdrop of all this, we have reduced federal, state, and global support uh, in order to, to, to address these problems, to address these, these huge needs. And within this context, and I'm seeing it daily as, as a faculty member right here, uh, we have increased system, science, and data complexity. We now know more than we've ever known and we have this thing on our fingertips, it's the whole knowledge base of the world in the tip of our hand. This is phenomenal, I mean, but how do we, how do we wrestle this down to solve problems? Well, there's a lot of negatives that I see. Uh, more and more people distrust science. Uh, we have corporate consolidation, I won't go through the whole list here just because we don't have time, but we have all of these what I call headwinds to address key issues. Maybe one of the ones that, that I see down here that, that you can see is actually fear of GMOs. Uh, the EU just outlawed uh, or gave a negative rolling role on the use of CRISPR for gene editing technologies. Uh, this is, these are things that we're really gonna have to wrestle with. Uh, but fear not, I mean, these are a lot of headwinds that we're, we're working with in society to address grand challenges. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually always a bit of an optimist. And at the head of what we have in, in the human species, I think, is, is we have this thing that we're naturally innovators. And I, I feel a lot better today after listening to some of the talks from our students here, is that innovation is alive and well. It's doing well. It's being nurtured. Uh, so in order to address these problems, we have new tools to generate uh, genetic variability. I think about that a lot as a career. Uh, we have new methods to reduce cycle time, marker-assisted breeding. Instead of taking 10 years to, to develop a new variety, we might be able to do it in four or six. Uh, we have all of this new data. We have big data. We have new modeling methodologies that can help us understand system complexities. Our engineering advances and our advances in robotics are always moving forward. And increasingly in agriculture, we're doing that too. Uh, and so we have all these other things. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is a positive or a negative, and sometimes when I talk to my kids who are in college and in, in upper high school now, uh, we have all the social media events. When I look at the tweets that come out these days, I, sometimes I just don't know what to think. Uh, so we have increased connectivity. In some ways, I think it really works well to our advantage. In other ways, it, it works against us. And you never know where the political wins are going to go. All right? So this, to me, is the context in which we're operating today, uh, very well condensed uh, to, a, to address global grand challenges. Let's take a look at North Carolina's situation. 
Maybe some of you don't know, but North Carolina is, is about the third most diverse crop production state in the nation. Agriculture in North Carolina is big business. It accounts for about 18 to 20 percent of our state domestic project, of our state domestic product. We're a you know three to five billion dollar a year industry if you count ag. So ag is really important uh, here in North Carolina. Uh, we benefit at NC State and the UNC system uh, by having an exceptionally good agricultural research station network across the state. We literally span from the mountains in the west to the sea on the east. I spend a good bit of my time on the research stations down east, uh, more than I spend in the mountains. But uh, this network really is one of our, our key, uh, I don't want to say a, it, it really is a key enabler of, of conducting high quality research focused on addressing crop production needs uh, here in North Carolina, but also globally. So in many ways, I think North Carolina also represents a microcosm of what's happening on a global basis. We have drought, we have floods, we have high heat, we have frost, we have environments in the mountains that are north of 3,000 feet, we have sea level environments. In many ways, North Carolina is a transition state and that sets us up uh, that we can address some of these big global needs, not only translate it here at home, but translate those findings across the states and across the globe too. And I think that that sets North Carolina up for many good things in the future. We have a really, really dynamic ag industry. We have a really dynamic biotech industry also. Okay, so that's just kind of setting the stage. It, it sort of sets a, a bit of a framework that I work in as an applied breeder trying to develop varieties for farmers and increasingly working more and more in agricultural development. Let's talk about sweet potato a little bit. I'll, I'll share with you some of the things on, on my program. I also want to tell you that I'm also a potato breeder, uh, but I do spend most of my time as a sweet potato breeder. Uh, so this is a sweet potato field. If, uh, if you're lucky, uh, when you dig the crop, you're going to get a nice, uh, nice crop, uh, high yielding crop of uh, sweet potatoes. And this, this would be actually our variety called Covington. Covington is grown on roughly about 85 to 90% of our acres right now. Uh, on one hand, I'm really proud of that. On the other hand, I'm afraid of that because I don't like to see that one variety dominate the, our acres that way. But uh, I'm here to tell you that sweet potato is that and so much more. There's a huge range of variability in sweet potato. We have the conventional orange flesh types. Uh, we spoke a lot about anthocyanins and blueberries this morning, and I'm, I'm really excited about that. We actually have purple flesh sweet potatoes that produce phenomenal amounts of anthocyanins also. Uh, we have white and yellow flesh, the staple types, which are down on the lower left hand, left hand corner of your screen. And more and more, uh, what you're finding is that uh, there's more and more interesting value-added products being produced in sweet potatoes. Show of hands, who of you have recently had sweet potato french fries? That's pretty good showing. Usually it's almost every person in the audience here must be coming really, really healthy so you're here. here. That wasn't there 10 years ago. The advent of French fries, of sweet potato fries, really, if I would have asked someone to raise their hand, the room would have been one or two people. Now it's really, really quite common. Uh, but we're producing a lot of other things. I won't talk about these today, but I do this also quite a bit. And I think I've already seen them here in Canapolis in some of the planting boxes. Uh, does anybody know these right here, by any chance? These are ornamental sweet potatoes. Thank you, Mandy, you would know that. Uh, ornamental sweet potatoes that actually we breed and are the same species of all those other ones that create the, the orange, the purple, and the white and yellow flesh sweet potatoes. Same species uh, result of breeding. They don't produce storage roots. What they produce is what I call eye candy. No GMOs used there, conventional breeding. Conventional breeding methodology is used to push the crop in a different direction. In this case, it's to produce beautiful foliage uh, for the ornamental sector. Okay, uh, 
I'm very pleased to say, and I think fortunate to say, that our, our breeding program is, has active engagements in all of those red dotted and red circled areas. So we truly are a global breeding program, and I do get a fair amount of miles um, in my air traffic at, at least uh, once a year. I think American Airlines likes me quite a bit. I'm pleased to say that we're, we're well known in NC State. This is a picture of our chancellor that uh, visited us at one of our research sites uh, in Uganda at a national research program called NACRA, NACRI. Uh, I have two, two PhD students that I've graduated there. Uh, Randy's talking to, to uh, a group right now. And you know if your chancellor goes out to you, well, your dean needs to come visit you then too. This is a picture of Dean Linton uh, about a year and a half ago with uh, also Gene Restino and me. And uh, the, the gentleman that's giving the talk right there is one of my most recent graduate students, Dr. Robert, or Dr. Bernard Yada. Uh, again, at not really done and telling him about some of the materials we have in the greenhouse. Okay, so what you can see here from this slide is that sweet potato is actually a tropical crop. And you can immediately see by the green and the yellow, uh, the green and the yellows are, are areas where there's high production, high yields per acre. Uh, the red areas are, and red and brown are, are areas of low productivity, low yields per acre. But what you can see really quickly is China is actually the major producer of sweet potatoes globally. But what you can also see is that Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, that swath across the uh, African continent right there, sweet potatoes are extremely popular. But the yields are really, really low. You can see that by the browns and reds. Uh, this is actually a hunger map. Uh, developed by the FAO uh, back in 2015 in terms of where we've met our hunger goals in terms of feeding people um, you know, good nutrition, but also just uh, calories too. And you'll have to trust me on this one, I think you can. The areas of blue in Sub-Saharan Africa, that, that's the uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Up above that is Sudan and the South, uh, South Sudan and the Northern Sudan. They're red, they're dark red, all right? They're just, they're just not reported in this map, but they're very, very dark red, and you can see India is quite yellow. And what I like to do is I like to superimpose that map. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, that sweet potato as a stable crop really matches quite well with the FIO hunger map. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we're looking at sweet potato as another crop to alleviate poverty and hunger particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's partly the reason why the Gates Foundation, who is one of our major partners, has funded uh, crop improvement work for sweet potato, all right? Just that confluence of eggs. Uh, let's, let's kind of look at what happened to sweet potato in the last 20 years. It's actually the period of time that I've been here in North Carolina. Uh, this is uh, a graph of acres harvested. Our acres harvested have uh, increased twofold. It's actually closer to threefold at this point now. Um, our production in terms of hundred weight uh, has increased threefold during, during a relatively short period of time, and our yields have increased uh, quite dramatically. Uh, this is the release of our variety Covington. We released Covington in 2005, and I would love to say that Covington was, you know, was responsible for this dramatic increase in, in yield over time. Our genetic gain over time is actually quite high. But truth be told, uh, Covington's part of, the, of, the, of it, but really it's the innovation of our growers, the advent of improved uh, cultural management, the advent of a high quality seed system, and particularly the advent of storage. And uh, uh, all of those came together at the right time to help kind of propel our industry forward. But I've worked with a lot of crops over the years. I've never seen yield curves like this in terms of genetic gain. Uh, with the exception of the hockey stick that, that Maze had showed back in the, in the 50s. Uh, so this is what's happened during the last 20 years in, in North Carolina. This is just North Carolina now. Let's see what happened in Sub-Saharan Africa. Pretty much our acre harvested is, is relatively flat. Our production has gone up through inter inter incremental gains in, in, in acreage or hectares. But there's the yield curve for sweet potato across Sub-Saharan Africa. It's essentially flat. If we're going to feed people um, increasing populations, and I'll get to that in a little bit, 
we're going to have to bend that yield curve upwards and improve yields uh, in sweet potato to feed people. But we don't want to only feed people uh, empty calories. We want to feed them with highly nutritional foods uh, like you're doing here at five, uh, so that they really benefit you from a nutrition point of view and not only just a caloric point of view. So the reality is, is in terms of global nutrition and food security, out of a world population of about 7 billion right now, roughly about 2 billion suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. That's a big percentage. And about 800 million suffer from calories. So sweet potato can provide a lot of calories, but it can also provide a lot of high quality calories in terms of micronutrients. And so that's why we're doing the work that we do. One of the things that really surprised me as I was digging into the literature, just kind of finding some things here, is actually the prevalence of undernourishment is highest in Africa. But what surprised me was the absolute number of undernourished people is actually greatest in Asia. I didn't know that. And partly I think it's a reflection of, of that, what you saw in the FAO map is the India and the Southeast Asia area there. There's some real issues there, and if you go back to those maps, sweet potato is an important part there. But let's ask the question, why should we invest uh, in developing orange sliced sweet potatoes uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa? Well, there's a couple of good reasons. One, I've already showed you that sweet potato is a major food staple, and it's also a cash crop in much of the developing world, in much of the southern latitudes. It really is an important crop. But the dominant varieties are all these white flesh plates that you see up on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, they don't contain beta-carotene. Beta-carotene is uh, converted the body into vitamin A. Vitamin A deficiencies are rampant across the globe. In southern, in sub-Saharan Africa, roughly about 48% of the children suffer from vitamin A deficiencies. Uh, if we can develop a biofortified sweet potato, we can help to address vitamin A deficiencies in, in children and particularly in pregnant women also who are major consumers and producers of that. Just one 25 gram, one small root of sweet potato provides the daily required vitamin A, a need uh, uh, according to RDA, all right? That's the vitamin A needs of, a, of one child. Uh, one of the things that you don't know about sweet potato probably being here in North Carolina is actually uh, sweet potato, in certain regions of the world, almost all parts of sweet potato are used. The foliage, the, those, that bright green lush foliage is actually eaten by many people. I've had it many, many times. It really is, is the African version of our colored greens, if you will. Uh, so I've eaten a lot of sweet potato. These are very, very healthy. Uh, it can be fed to livestock. Those livestock, in turn, provide meat and milk for kids. Uh, we can convert it into uh, porridges for children. We can make it into juices. Uh, we, can, we can dry it and substitute it for wheat flour. Up to about 40% uh, sweet potato flour can be used to make a really good bread substituting wheat, which is typically imported into many countries across the globe. So there's a lot, a lot of different purposes for it. The vines uh, serve as a planting material, but also Growing high quality vines for planting material reckon, reckon, represent economic opportunity for vine producers too. So there's a lot of things that you can done with the crop uh, in a, across the spectrum. I first began involved with sweet potatoes through a, a foundation called the McKnight Foundation, which is based in uh, Minnesota. It's actually the heirs of the 3M Corporation established this foundation. And I worked with them through what we call the Collaborative Crop Research Program. And I first came to, uh, to uh, the foundation back in about 1996. And they do work around the globe, but primarily in, in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa right now. And our goals back then were to develop what we call high-yielding, multiple-resistant sweet potato germplasm and to convert uh, the diet from white flesh sweet potatoes to orange flesh, high vitamin A varieties, but these varieties had to be have the culinary quality that Africans prefer, and they also have to have the disease and pest resistance 
that are required. Uh, so these are some orange genotypes that we have right here. Uh, these are the primary production constraints. So as a breeder, I'm, I'm deeply interested in nutrition. I understand that. But I also have to develop varieties that yield well and that have the requisite disease and pest resistance uh, so that farmers actually want to grow them and can grow them profitably. Our big constraints are sweet potato virus disease. You can see it on the, on the left hand of your screen. Uh, also sweet potato weevil. I have seen SBVD, sweet potato virus disease, and sweet potato weevil totally decimate crops of sweet potato across Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm talking 80% damage to 100% damage, especially during the dry season. All right? And it depends on the country where you're at, whether you have one wet and two dries, or whether you have one long wet or one dry. It makes a big difference. But I've seen this, particularly sweet potato weevil, totally devastate a crop. And what happens is when the weevil lays its eggs on those storage roots, uh, the storage roots reduce a phyto, or produce a phytochemical, which makes the storage roots unpalatable. So you can't even cut out the weevil and eat the good part, because the whole root's producing this phyto chemical that really reduces the quality. So it's a real problem. Uh, my group here being sort of a higher order group developed what we call the first genetic linkage map of sweet potato. This was done back in, in the uh, around 2000, uh, 2010 or so. We've, we've gone several iterations beyond this. Uh, the group in Africa, uh, my, my early PhD students uh, have developed the varieties for Africans in Africa. And uh, we've been a part of that journey, but really the work was led there. So far we've released about 20 varieties, mostly in East Africa, but we've now expanded our efforts with the Gates Foundation's help and others' help uh, to West Africa and Southern Africa too. Uh, you may have heard that in 2016, I believe, that Sweet Potato uh, team was, uh, was awarded the World Food Prize. Did anybody know that or is that the first knowledge for you here? Yeah, uh, two of the World Food Prize food prize recipients during that year, which we consider to be the sort of the Nobel laureate in agriculture, where our fancy take our hats. Uh, so we can breeders and we're very proud of that. All right, let me tell you a little bit about breeding sweet potatoes. And I'll do it really quick for you. I won't try to make it too complex. The things that I want you to know here uh, are that one, it's a long-term process. You can see it on the left. Uh, time to release to a new farm. Uh, to, a, to a farmer is usually anywhere between six to eight years. That's probably pretty optimistic. You might want to make it eight to ten years or so. Uh, the other thing I want you to see is that uh, it's a numbers game too. We typically plant out about 60,000 unique genotypes in the field every year. This year, my team has planted up close to 50 acres of sweet potato trials. What we do is we start out with a unique single plant uh, in, in a season, we put out about 60,000 of those. They're spaced about three, three feet apart. And then our goal there is to identify those, those plants, those unique genotypes that seem like they have potential to be a new variety. We take that single plant, we put it in a bag, we store it, we bed it out the next year, and next year we're able to generate two plots with 25 plants each. We plant those out at two different sites here in the state. Um, we grow the crop, we harvest the crop, and then we make our selections. We whittle the population down in year one from about 60,000 to anywhere from about two to 4,000 unique genotypes. It's that 2,000 to 4,000 that gets planted out as two 25 plant plots. So we start from one plant, we go to 50 plants, we have a little bit more to look at, it, and we're starting to learn a little bit better. Go through the cycle again, we whittle the population down, we might whittle the population down to a couple hundred or so. Now we're looking at three to, three to five different sites. As a hundred plant plots, we get a much better look at it across many different environments, and we start to hone in on, you know, what looks like it might be a new potential variety, all right? And so we go through this process iteratively every year. But the thing that a lot of folks don't realize as a breeding is we're not doing this as a sort of a straight line process, right? You know, single plant, 225, three, three, three to five, 100 plant plots. We're doing all of this in parallel every year. So everything that you see on here, we're managing as one large trial each, each year. So all those trials are, are ongoing the same year. So if you're gonna be a breeder, uh, one, you're gonna have to know how to 
at least work in the field, but you're going to have to know how to manage uh, data and keep yourself organized. That's really a, a hallmark of an effective breeder is, is, is good organizational skills, I think. Um, this here is for the, the foodies in the group, and this, is, this here I think is, uh, is really, has always been my fascination. So this is a cross between an orange left sweet potato, the one on the left, and a purple flesh sweet potato, the one on the right. And this little disc here represents 20 progeny, 20 unique genotypes that came out of that cross. And you can see they vary from yellow to white to orange to purple, and then maybe even a little bit of purple with speckled orange in there if you look close. But think about the opportunities in this cross. Think about the functional products, the functional food products that are segregating in these materials. Anthocyanins, beta carotene, phenolins, lower glycemic index. I think we spoke about those this morning. Uh, so this is why I'm really fascinated with the work you're doing because I've learned so much. New flavors, exciting colors, different sugar, starch, and texture profiles, lower acrylamide levels. All of these things are stuff for food scientists uh, to work with because really this is their realm. All of these are produced by different biochemical pathways and that's what really excites me about kind of learning about what you're doing here. But the challenge is as a reader uh, is how do you decide which traits have value uh, and what tools do we use to do the job. And one of the things that's really going to surprise you a little bit uh, the food industry is always changing their mind. It's extremely frustrating for me as a breeder trying to develop a new value added product because one day they say, oh, we will love this purple flesh sweet potato you have. And then the other day they say, oh, no, it's not marketable. We're sorry. Uh, and I see that all the time uh, as, a, as a breeder. And keep in keep mind, my horizon is an eight year horizon. It's not a next year horizon. So when I sort of turn the boat, uh, it's a big turn. Uh, so trying to divine what's going to be the next new big item in the food area really is, uh, it's, it's really complex at times. It's hard to do. Okay, these are just a couple of quick pictures of, uh, of our plots. These are some of, the, of our smaller plots, multiple patients, multiple years. As breeders, again, it's not only about the, the pathways and the nutraceuticals, it's about the disease resistance, it's about the yield, it's about uh, viruses. Uh, here we screen for Fusarium, uh, Streptomyces, we talked about nematodes. Nematodes are a big issue, we've got to do that. This is a screen down the lower left hand corner for nematodes. And then we are rising with soft rock, which comes in in stores that we have to deal with. Uh, as breeders, we're working collaboratively with pathologists, virologists, nematologists uh, to try and get the job done and understand the resistance. Uh, this is the thing for the foodies. We have really gone into food science in a big, big, deep, deep way. Uh, we screen using near infrared reflectance spectroscopy, spoke about it earlier this morning. We use NEARS to screen several thousand genotypes a year for about 10 different traits with one, with one scan. It's been a huge tool for us. Uh, we're always doing bait tests, more and more we're doing chicken tests, uh, a lot of fry tests because of the fry market. So all of these things are done at scale with hundreds of genotypes and uh, in collaboration with food scientists. As a breeder, I'm interested in reducing uh, or increasing my throughput and reducing my workload. If I could use some of the methodologies that you've talked about here this morning to say assay for potential resistance, uh, to say glycemic index or so, uh, or food properties, these are things that as a breeder that I'd be looking for. Uh, my life has not gotten easier as the industry has grown. Back in 2020, uh, in 1997, we were interested in about maybe, I think it's 28 traits. Now, uh, fast forward to 2018, we're really interested in about 40 plus different traits. So life has not gotten easier. And what that has done is we've had to develop new tools to facilitate the breeding program uh, to look at traits and develop new varieties on a quicker scale. Um, and that sort of is the advent of this project, which I'll tell you very, very briefly about. It's what we call the Genomic Tools for Sweet Potato Improvement Project. 
It is an ambitious project to sequence uh, sweet potato. Sweet potato actually is a complex polyploid. It has six sets of 15 chromosomes for a total of 90 chromosomes. So genetically speaking, sweet potato is an extremely complex organism. Uh, and so that complexity uh, is a part of my reading uh, program. Uh, we were very fortunate to attract the attention of, well actually Sweet Potato was fortunate to attract the attention of the Gates Foundation uh, early on in, in, their, in their sort of life, if you will, as a foundation. Uh, they came to us, I worked with them on another project as a consultant, and they came to us at NC State to help them develop next generation breeding tools. And the scope of the project we have, we currently have 20 PIs in the project, we work at seven institutions across six countries, four continents, 15 time zones, uh, all focus on sweet potato, and the initial investment by the foundation here at NC State was a little over 12 million. Uh, so it's a big project. It's, uh, it's stretched me in ways that I would have never expect it, uh, but I've really had a good time with it. Uh, this character here uh, basically shows you the various aspects that the GT4SV project is engaged. We have a sweet potato genome effort led by Michigan State, Boyce Thompson Institute, at Cornell and the International Potato Center in, uh, in Lima, uh, Uganda, Kenya, and Ghana. We have a bioinformatics group that's deeply, that we're deeply engaged with because when you're starting to do genomic sequencing, uh, you really have to have a bioinformatics component that's led by our team here at NCSU, uh, University of Queensland in Australia, and again by SIP. We've developed a, a SNP genotyping uh, protocol that's tailored for sweet potato here at the state. Uh, then we have our own database, bioinformatics phenotyping platform. It's all integrated together. Uh, that's led by our partners at SIP at Michigan State and Boyce Thompson again, and the NACRI is one of the national programs. And of course, what we really want to do is translate all this new knowledge to our partners in Africa, to the breeding programs in Africa. We currently collaborate with three primary breeding programs, but we actually work within a network of 18 breeding programs around the country we come together several times a year to translate our knowledge. We've had a lot of great meetings, uh, and those meetings are actually held uh, all around the globe. Uh, we've uh, adjusted our attitudes. A friend of mine brought some uh, orange sunglasses, and uh, that was kind of get our focus on breeding for orange flesh sweet potato in, in Sub-Saharan Africa to address vitamin A deficiency. This is one of our early meetings in Uganda. Uh, we've had a lot of lab training. Of course, if you're going to do uh, genomic assisted breeding, you need to extract uh, high quality DNA. So we've done some, some lab training. These are actually uh, applied breeders and we're at a facility called the Biosciences East in Central Africa in Nairobi. Uh, the the uh, woman here with her hand up in the upper left hand corner is Dr. Mercy Katavi. Uh, she's explained DNA extraction. Uh, she's a SIP employee. She's actually explaining to one of the World Food Prize recipients, Dr. Maria Andrade. Uh, she's actually lead of the, the uh, Mozambican uh, sweet potato breeding program with the International Potato Center. Uh, we met in Rwanda, and most recently the team came together in my backyard. Uh, so this is the group of the GT4SPs in the backyard, and you can see my dog on the back side there looking for something, some kind of food drop. We couldn't get him to sit still. It's a great team. I've really been fortunate to work with the, with the whole group. And I've honestly learned a lot from every single one of them. Uh, if you're a reader, you're going to develop a lot of different mapping populations. This is just an overview of the mapping populations that we have. It goes from diploid sweet potatoes all the way through to cultivar sweet potatoes. And uh, you can see that we do multi-location phenotyping in, in, the, in the various sites below. Peru, USA, Ghana, Kenya, and Uganda right now. Uh, just some pictures of what some of our trials look like. Uh, that is a pile of sweet potatoes that, uh, that the techs are, are on right there. A uh, picture of me with the team in my natural garb, if you will, uh, in a place called Tamale Ghana, which is just uh, south of the, uh, the Sahara Desert. Um, and to touch base on some of the things that you're interested in, we're actually very interested in elite diversity of the carotenoid pathway. This is a project that's being led by Dr. Robert Buell and, uh, and Ken Lau at Michigan State. Uh, this is a result of having now having a reference genome for sweet potato that we've established within the context of the project. 
We're now looking at alleles out of sweet potato that are associated with flesh color. Uh, and this is, the, this is the biochemical pathway of, of beta carotene. Uh, this uh, phytine synthase, phytamine desaturase, the, the carotene isomerase, and the lycopene beta cyclase are some putative genes that we looked at. We've done a lot of, uh, uh, of expression profiling, of gene expression profiling, all things that we spoke about this morning. Uh, this is uh, on the panel there, it's, it's differentiated into undifferentiated tissue. Uh, fibrous roots, which are just the fibrous roots that actually feed the sweet potato, and then the storage roots, which are actually the sweet potato itself. And what you're seeing is differential expression in terms of beta carotene gene production, and it appears to be associated with a locus for lycopene in uh, chromosome 4 and also in chromosome 1. And so we've developed hypotheses on how best to address uh, boosting uh, beta carotene production in sweet potato. One thing that I have said, there's a negative linkage between dry matter content in sweet potato and beta carotene. The higher the dry matter, the lower the beta carotene. It's a negative linkage. Uh, Africans prefer high dry matter uh, sweet potatoes. So one of our challenges has been breeding high dry matter sweet potatoes with high beta carotene. Uh, we've broken this linkage and we're making good progress on it. All right, we're coming into home stretch here. So a couple things about where I see uh, plant breeding going um, in the future. And I would like to say, I, I hope I can get some of you excited. I mean, for me, it's a it's very exciting future, but it's not becoming more simple. But the avenues upon which someone could enter and contribute to uh, global food production are becoming really, really broad and why. And I honestly say that there's, there's a home for any discipline for a person who wants to get involved in crop production. There really is. Uh, and I, I want to share that with you. So we've now entered this era of what I call the genomic selection uh, era of plant breeding. Uh, basically, genomic selection is that we now have almost all the major crop species fully sequenced. Uh, we can genotype materials a lot cheaper than we can actually phenotype materials. We're now entering an era in which we can probably predict the performance of materials in the greenhouse uh, before we move them to the field. And you go back to what I showed you before, you know, all the various steps that the breed program has to go through. What you really want to do is you want to maximize your efficiency and the time that's spent in the field evaluating materials. Because really, that's where the expense is. That's where the noise is. The genotype by environmental interaction is very, very real. So now we can use this process called genomic selection to help predict which materials might perform better in the field, use that to whittle down the population, spend more time, more quality time in the field. You can also use genomic selection to predict which parental combinations will yield the most favorable results. We call that genetic estimated breeding value. Okay, so all of this is computationally very, very intensive. Uh, you have to have good bioinformatics skills, uh, but then along with the bioinformatics and the number handling skills, you have to have that connectivity, that transdisciplinary connectivity with actually guys like me who are more comfortable in the field uh, looking at materials, but accessing that technology. So that's really where where, where, sort of where I see breeding going. Um, so there's one, that's one thing that I want to share with you. I think you're all aware of what's also going on in farming right now, is we're moving towards some type of sensor-based agricultural system. Again, it will both be um, predictive and possibly prescriptive. And again, some of the students who have made their presentations here this morning are touching base on some of these things. Uh, we're now using satellites, we're now using drones, uh, we're using them to access many, many different things. Uh, for my interest, it's going to be more crop performance. How's a particular genotype responding to, say, heat stress or to drought stress? Uh, what does a crop look like on a, on a large scale? Where am I finding areas where maybe I could, I could differentially apply nitrogen fertilizer or phosphorus in the field? To, to maximize my crop, where are the disease outbreaks? 
We saw a picture earlier of the nematode work. All of that is, is sort of coming into these realms. So all of these tools are, are now starting to converge together. It's engineering based uh, that we're going to be using in ag to improve productivity over time. All right. Nutritional genomics and human health. Uh, I spent some time kind of reading a publication that was from Corella et al. here. And, you know, the thing that I came up with, and, and partly it goes back to the conversation that Massimo and I had as we were walking over here today, is this is an area that is, I think you all understand it, but is, is, is ready, ready to take off. It's little understood. There's huge opportunity. There's huge gaps in our knowledge right now, and particularly breeders and nutritionists uh, really need to talk more, and the medical community needs to talk more. I'm convinced of that, but it's been very difficult putting those two disciplines together. And I think this figure sort of represents all of that too here. This is actually uh, coming out for, uh, what is it, it's uh, cardiovascular disease. And to me, you know, it just looks at, at the diet, the genetic component of both our crops and the humans that are consuming them, and, and what, what happens when you consume those. And I think that one of the things that really strikes me is that uh, we humans are quite diverse too. So the performance of a particular nutraceutical may not be the same across all ethnicities, across all uh, you know, male and female, across gender. So there's going to be those interactions too, which make it really, really complex. But again, phenomenal, fascinating areas of research that can be tackled. And there are great conversations and collaborations yet to be made. And partly that's why I get so excited about listening to what you've done, because I think th these are where these conversations begin. All right, I, I think I'm on good time right here. So that is, for me, basically, you know, a core to force of, of sort of how a reader is approaching uh, these areas that you're talking about today. I, I hope you have a little bit better sense of what my programs are like. I, I hope you come across knowing a little bit more about plant breeding, uh, particularly about plant breeding at NC State. Um, I hope I sensitize to you a little bit uh, in a very small way as to what some of the global grand challenges that we all face together are and, and, and an area that, that we've done a little bit of work in. Um, heard a little bit about what this concept of called biofortification of food staple crops is. It has great potential, and, and sweet potato is an example. And then I'll go back to the future of plant breeding. I think one of the things I, I usually give a talk, it's an undergrad talk in, in, in a class called Science and Technology. Uh, I don't want to make breeders say everybody, although I would like, like to welcome a couple more folks into our, into our realm. But really what I would like to say is, is that when we're addressing sustainability and we're, when, we're, when we're addressing crop production, global food production, if you're a young student and you feel that you, you really like the bioinformatics and you like the computational biology and you're looking for a place to sort of call home and to have relevance, breeding has it for you. If you are a gene jockey and you want to use new gene editing technologies to improve, say, banana, uh, there's a home for you. Uh, if you like to get your boots dirty and walk out in the field and sweat uh, and stand behind a tractor, which is actually kind of my comfort zone, but I don't get to do it as much as I used to, there's a home for you in breeding. So it really dis it's broad discipline. If your interests lie in food science and production of new value-added products or nutraceuticals, and you're brave enough to work with a plant breeder who needs big numbers uh, in the lab instead of just one or two samples, there's a good home for you. In fact, one of my major collaborators is a USDARS food scientist who, who really is not scared by the hundreds of genotypes that we bring him, uh, into the lab. Uh, and there's a home for you there. So really, there's, there's, there's great need, and uh, you don't all have to be the same color, uh, the same, you know, like the same sort of discipline. Uh, there's a spectrum of opportunities out there for you. 
And I hope I've shared that a little bit of that with you today. Uh, so with that, I'll stop there. I would like to thank, I've got too many individual people to thank. So what I typically do is I want to thank our partners. It's really our partners that, that uh, keep the show going, so to speak. They keep the wheels turning. And again, you can see that it's a, it's a multitude of different types of partners spanning commodity associations, private industry, big foundations, small foundations, local foundations, international foundations, uh, and then the, the federal government then too really helps us get the job done. Uh, I will stop right there, and if, if you have any questions, I notice the group is not a good question asking group this morning. Uh, I, would, I would do my best to, to entertain any questions, either here or afterwards. Thank you for your time. Yes. I planted that one here, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Uh, it's you can, does the processing might help to translate the, uh, the orange potato in the market or not? I think that's an excellent question. And uh, what my initial answer would be it's very difficult to get any good numbers on it. But, oh, sorry. Uh, how much could processing change sweet potato production in sub Saharan Africa? Does that yeah. kind of capture the sentiment? Yeah. And my, my, my reply is, is, one, it's really hard to get those types of numbers. Uh, but my guess would be that the vast majority of the crop are produced by, by small landholders on probably less than a hectare, maybe a half hectare to maybe, you know, two to five or so. So the vast majority of the crop is still consumed directly, uh, probably 80 plus 85 percent. But as part of the projects that we're engaged with, uh, with other partners, the processing opportunities are substantial. And I would say they're really substantial, going back to something that I said earlier. Huge shift now in terms of urbanization across Sub-Saharan Africa. Nairobi, Johannesburg, Accra, you know, Lagos, huge cities that aren't producing their own food. So those are those opportunities. And I think there's great opportunity for that and what excites me is that will probably change from small landholders uh, maybe to slightly more mid-scale or cooperatives who will produce larger, larger amounts of crop, which could be, have value added to it. And then it becomes a cash crop, not only a subsistence crop. So great opportunity, but a long way to go. to that decision, uh, but I think that the needs are so significant uh, and the tools have such great potential that I'm really disappointed to see that, that, uh, that perhaps they will be shelved in that area uh, for the betterment of humanity. And I, I don't think that they're, you know, you, you can't cast a broad net and, and capture all the, the potential issues with it. So there, there have been some publications that came out here that there are, there, uh, with the CRISPR technology, that there are deeper genomic changes than we really realize. They're not as, as target specific as we thought. And I don't know, you know, how, how, you know, how truthful those, those are, that, that report. But I, I think that the, these technologies have great potential in many different areas, and, and, and it's sad that they can't move forward. In an African context, uh, pretty much, much of Sub-Saharan Africa is, is, uh, is influenced uh, largely more by the European uh, mindset and perspective than it is on the rest of the global perspective. So it will have influence on our partners, and it will have influence on, on what governance, we're just now establishing laws and, 
and rules and regulations in many countries as to how they're going to treat these these uh, these materials. So I, I'm in general disappointed. Yeah, so the question was, is uh, when we do sequencing of sweet potatoes, this is, a, this is one of those things that I sort of glossed over a little bit for you. Uh, it, as a complex polyploid, do we do genetic sequencing at diploid level using wild relatives of sweet potato, or do we do sequencing at the cultivated level, at the hexaploid level, which is extremely, extremely difficult to do? Uh, our sequencing has, has been done at the diploid level using two wild relatives, putative wild relatives of sweet potato, Ipomoea trifida and Ipomoea triloba. We have a, it's called the Sweet Potato Genomics Resource. Uh, we now have our, our sequence of publicly available and, and on the web and partially annotated. We're looking for more and more people to, to, to kind of join us and, and work with us in that area. Robin Mule's team and Zhang Jun Fei at Boys Thompson Institute, Robin Mule at Michigan State, Zhang Jun Fei at VTI uh, Cornell uh, uh, helped us do the sequencing. Uh, they're very relevant for the hexaploid sweet potato. But we have embarked upon a pretty ambitious project to, to sequence hexaploid sweet potato uh, with a company called NRG. And uh, so we're pretty far along that path. And I think that that would be a much more useful uh, assembly than the trifida and the triloba assemblies. Those two assemblies that we have right now are actually very high quality. Uh, there's been some other assemblies published in a couple other areas that I think we've done a much better job. And we've, we've, it's led us to understand the, the evolution of sweet potato, which has been pretty good for a guy who wants to know more about sweet potato, but I don't know that it's really relevant across the public spectrum. Saw a couple more hands up. Megan, do you have? Oh, that's a great question. You know, uh, we have, we're, we're, all, we're, we're always collecting new traits of interest, and we have a repository to go back. When you say a repository, repository of data or repository of genotypes? Either. Yeah, we have both. You had the data, you didn't have the genotype. Where are you? We have both, and I'm going to do a quick job of connecting for you. And it's a great question because I can connect to, to one of our, our speakers here, the soybean cyst nematode. Okay. Uh, we now have a new nematode that just appeared in North Carolina. It's called Melitogyne uh, enterlobion. It's a really damaging uh, nematode. Uh, our, our primary nematode is Melitogyne incognita, root knot nematode. Enterlobion is also a pest of, of soybean too, by the way. It's a really broad host range. Um, so, merging new uh, nematode. Found it in a lot of sweet potato fields in a couple different counties two years ago, more last year. Who knows what's going to happen this year? Graduate student of mine worked with African germplasm, one of our mapping populations I showed you, Beauregard by Tanzania. Tanzania is actually an African land race, white flesh, very high crime matter, resistant sweet potato virus disease. We screened about 10 plus years ago for resistance to a broad range of nematode species, just because, uh, just because we're interested. In it, you know, turns out that genotype, Tanzania. Resistant to every single nematode we toss at it. About five different species, about three or four different races. So you know that we went like right back to Tanzania. We have that mapping population. Boom, we're going to it. We're screening it again for Antilobii. We hope we find resistance. That will be our source of resistance uh, moving forward potentially. But so yeah, that, that's kind of kept in our in the back of our mind. As soon as we hit that, I remember the, student, the student's work that he, that he did. It was like, oh, we've got to go dig that out. We've got to screen this now. So we're, we're kind of on that in a big, big way. Uh, and we'll see what we find. Now we have better tools. Now we have a mapping population that's genotyped with 30,000 plus snips. Now we can identify maybe the low side for that and really kind of dig into it, sort of using what, what we learned about a little bit this morning. So I was kind of interested in that, in that talk. I thought it was great. So, yeah, I 
take a whole year for lunch, but I'll take one more if you want. Thank you very much for your time. So before we leave uh, for lunch, I'd like to give Dr. Gensho a special thanks for being here today and sharing all of his knowledge and wisdom with us. It's been great having you here, and we'd like to give you a P2EP swag bag. Ooh, nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me just say that it's a special being thanked by, by Ashley because I have sat on her committee for the master's degree. Uh, I've really seen her grow, and she's doing a great job. Well done. So uh, we will reconvene at 1.30 after lunch, and so the buffet lines are set up in the lobby atrium, and we also invite you to speak with our students and go past their posters and talk to them during the lunch hour, please. Thank you.